Midtown Studios of Bloomberg Television in New York City, this is Charlie Rose. After studying drama in Paris, Kristen Scott Thomas landed her first film role in The Singer Prince's 1986 film, Under the Cherry Moon. Since then, she's established herself as a kind of epitome of British restraint in films like Four Weddings and a Funeral, Angels and Insects, and A Handful of Dust. But it is her role in The English Patient that is bringing her extraordinary attention, earned her a Golden Globe nomination, a probable Oscar, and praise from film critics like Janet Maslin of the New York Times, who said, The English Patient sets off sparks with the grand entrance of Catherine, played by Kristen Scott Thomas, in a great career-altering change of pace. Joining me now, Kristen Scott Thomas. Welcome Thank to that you. introduction. <laughs> uh, let me just jump right into the movie itself, though. So, uh, you read the book where? When did you first I read, the read book this in book? in Romania. You're making a film in Romania? I was making a film in Romania, um, a film uh, with a very interesting director called Lucian Pantelier. Yes. I didn't know if you've seen The, the Oak. That was a really great it, film. Know, you know. Anyway, I was making that film there and desperate for sort of all things exotic and warm and um, sort of, I don't know, opposite to Romanian. Um, and I, w I read this book and, and got to the end and was so devastated at having no more pages to turn that I just went back to the beginning and I did this three times. You read it? I read it three, three times, times, cover to cover, yeah. Mm. And Catherine said what to you? Uh, Catherine said, you know, Catherine, Catherine wasn't really why I loved it so much. Why I loved it so much was the imagery and the, and it was really Hannah and Kip. Yeah, that affair. Yeah. Because Catherine in the book, I find she's sort of ghostly and yeah, not She's really more there. seductive and more something else well, she's, in the she, film. Yeah, she, but, but, but no, she has a really strong passion and really um, sort of, uh, what's the word? Uh, she's really vibrant in the book, but she's not really there. Or, or perhaps I didn't see her, maybe it was on purpose. Yeah. I don't then know. Then why were you desperate to play her? Well, because then I read the screenplay. And what Anthony had done um, in his adaptation was to make... Um, it's, it's more like a, a, a brother or a sister to the book rather than an adaptation yeah. of it because he has altered things in it. And he's, he brought out from the dark, he brought out from the sort of dream world, yeah. Catherine Clifton, and that suddenly she was there you know, on the page with you. And that's, when I, that's what I must do in this film because I just wanted to be part of it. I didn't know, in, in, you know to what, how I could possibly be involved in this film because I wasn't right for Hannah, you know, what mm -hmm. could I do? Um, and then there was Catherine. Tell me about Catherine, though, the, because we're going to see you as Catherine. What, how did you see her, and how did you change uh, as you began to prepare mm, for the role? That's such a difficult question for me to answer, because these things I... I saw Catherine. I don't know how I changed at all. I don't know how I got to where I... All I seemed to be doing, as far as I was concerned, was saying the words, and saying the words in the right environment, with the right clothes, with the right person answering me, and the right person me pushing me onto the stage. Yeah. It was as simple as that. I, uh, I, there was quite a long process of actually getting to the first day of, of, of shooting, like the things I read out. I read a bit of, about the desert, not much, you know, a bit about women exploring the desert and yeah. women of that period and things. And um, I, I, I just felt I wanted to play someone who was, who, who just opened up who was just open and um, assured and confident Here's and sunny what, and up. Yeah. And, and wanted everything. And, want, and wanted everything. everything. That's the only thing I have in common with her, I think. <laughs> you want everything. Mm, I think so. Do you? Well, you try. I think most yeah. people do, don't they? They just don't admit it. But you've got most of it, don't you? You have a right, marriage, you have two kids. I have a lot you've of things. You've got a role that has catapulted you yeah, sure. to where you'd like to be. Yeah. That, yeah, and I've got lots more things to do. When you look at the performance on the screen, mm. um, what do you, what, what do you well, see? It's very odd when I look at the performance on the screen because I have a memory, you know, I have my, my own film in my head of what we did when we were there. I think it happens every time you make a movie, it's like yeah. this. Um, and 
you know, I can remember sitting on top of the dune um, with the crew around me and, yeah. and, I, and, and then saying, saying the words and acting out the scene and, and all these things. And then suddenly I'm seeing the same thing on the screen with this other woman in the way, yeah. you know, this sort of blonde yeah. thing. You know, that, yeah. that, that's my place. She should get out. She, the, the film, why do you think this film has captured such, other than performance and other than good direction? I mean, Janet I Maslin and all the film critics I hear unanimously, unanimously, when we looked at films for 1996, selected at number one. I just think that it's, it's a story, the book was the same. Um, well, the book did it for me anyway. There was something so intimate about the writing and um, through the writing that became the screenplay and that became what we say to each other, i.e. The, the, the action that's happening on the screen. And I think that um, it's, it's so, it touches everybody. There isn't one person, I don't, I don't know, maybe there is, but yeah. when you go to the film, everybody has different moments in the film where they just think, oh, moment of sort of enlightenment. And, and that's yeah. when, that's, it's, it's he's like, talking to me. He's talking yeah, to exactly. me about me and yeah. my life. He knows and, me. And there's he something knows my sort of, experience or his experiences. Yeah, just sort of intimate, but that just sort of applies to everybody. Uh, it's, it's extraordinary, the, the subject and... And then, of course, it's so beautiful. And I think we really need that kind of beauty to be reminded yeah. about how beautiful It has beautiful almost an epic quality because yeah. of the Absolutely. small, intimate story mm. set against this larger background sure. of the desert and the war. Mm. Roll tape. Here is a clip from The English Patient. Why did you follow me yesterday? I'm sorry, what? After the market, you followed me to the hotel. I was concerned for a woman in that part of Cairo, a European woman, and I felt obliged to. You felt obliged to? As the wife of one of our party. So why follow me? Escort me, by all means, but follow me is predatory, isn't it? talking about this attraction between these two people mm -hmm. during, while we were watching mm -hmm. that he's attracted to her because what I think it's because she's she just she's the only one who actually dares tease him like that yeah. and see through him and see the child that is standing there this child that's stomping through the desert collecting things to stick in his book yeah. um, and I think that that he's just he just can't resist I think he's probably a terrible Playboy when he gets to Cairo. I mean, this is this I get from the book that yeah. he hang around in bars and and things like this. And so, and this woman who is so unattainable because she's married to somebody else, yeah. because she's she's sort of glamorous and comes from England where yeah. everything's sort of organised and, yeah. and and then, in the end, an act of betrayal for her is unacceptable. That's why she can't. I think it's it's more than unacceptable. It's just. It's unimaginable. Yeah, it's just she just cannot. She's physically incapable of coping with it. I think she just feels completely. She's the sort of person who would always be able to find her center and find her balance. And then this this thing that happens to her, and she gets drawn irresistibly drawn to this man, sets her off balance, and she just can't bear it. I think. Um, and the love for her husband is something that is so, so strong and, and has been there forever. She's always known this man. Would every woman like to be pursued the way he pursued her? Does every woman love the fact that someone is quite willing to risk everything and is quite mad about her? I don't talk her? about every woman. Okay, but tell me, are you? Oh, I, I mean, is I mean, that yeah, such a romantic sort of, notion that overwhelms of every, all of us? I think it's this sort of, this idea of being um, rescued from from the sort of boring, mundane world and being yeah. taken away to other places is... Um, Someone know, who says, I want to take you away from I mean, it, every day. It's, you know, we write songs about it, we make yeah. movies about it. I think it must be quite deep, deeply... Uh, there must have been, I assume to make these kinds of things work, there has to be some kind of chemistry. I mean, you and Rafe had something. I mean, Definitely. Anthony said that he saw you almost like two thoroughbreds. Mm -hmm. uh, 
who were quite, as you peeled away layers, there was always more and unrestrained and all of that. I mean, they, it was like these two people mm -hmm. in the end, in terms of the actors he had. Mm -hmm. I think that the, the thing that made it work for, for Rafe and me, and I think for all the other people sure. in the cast as well, is that we were both passionately in love with this story yeah. and these characters. And that it, I so wanted to be, to be Catherine Clifton, and he so wanted to be Al Marshi, that we were both sort of completely locked into this little... To be meaning what? You mean you wanted well, to make sure you fully that we, that we, fill the that vessel that, that is them? Exactly, yeah. And that it was, that it could be seen to be that the end result, that what we were going to give the director and the editor to put together was going to make the characters that we wanted, would want to see in and want way, to believe is, in. Is this the film experience that you'd always dreamed that filmmaking would be about? Yeah, sometimes it's like this. It's been like this a couple of times. Where else? Um, well, this Romanian film yeah, that right. I made that... Where well, you spoke some Romanian, I hear? I spoke all Romanian. All Romanian. Um, but learnt like a parrot, you know, not yeah, very... Yeah, right. not, not particularly clever. Um, and I think also in Angels and Insects there were some times like that, which were, we just felt that the, that the piece was just flying, and um, it's, some, it's to do with the director, and it's to do with your partners, and, and how much you all want to do the same thing, and how much you are prepared to tell the story as yeah. honestly as you can. Here is another scene, English patient, take a look. Comfort absolutely is not. That scene, what was funny about it? You well, said? this was a scene that we did for the audition, and um, I remember sitting there on this sort of bench thing in this office and starting off the scene saying, This isn't very good, is it? And Rafe goes to me, It is, you're doing fine. <laughs> <laughs> and I was so angry. Yeah. Because, you know, I'd because obviously caught him out. Because I was, I was doing the scene, I was yeah. acting, oh, yeah, you know, yeah, this yeah. isn't very good, is it? And he, he thought that I was being insecure about, you know, what I was doing. And he, so I, I felt that he must have thought that it wasn't very good, very complicated. But yeah. uh, I couldn't You know, he was reassuring you. Yeah, he was reassuring he was me or something terrible. Yeah. She represents freedom, we'd say. Mm -hmm. you know? She really does so. represent somebody who... I think she represents freedom simply because she's so uh, sure of her own... Um, her own needs and her, her own you know, where she is who she is um, that she can just about do anything she likes because she she can she has this as i said this sense of balance so that she could she'll always come back to center to, to center to foundation so she can really i mean she can she can really do what she likes and say what she likes and that's what i love about her and she assumes she can always come back there will always be a place for her because she's so something because she's so something i haven't quite found yeah. the word yet all right roll tape this is uh a scene with rape. Take a look. So very badly. Well, you don't sew at all. A woman should never learn to sew, and if she can, she shouldn't admit to it. Close your eyes. Oh, makes it harder still. <laughs> When were you most happy? <laughs> now. And when were you least happy? Now. <laughs> what do you love? What do I love? Say everything. Mm, let's see. Water. Mm -hmm. Fish in it. Hedgehogs. I love hedgehogs. Uh, what else? Marmite. 
I'm addicted. And Bob's. It's not with other people. <laughs> Islands. Your handwriting. Mm. Go on all day. Go on all day. You, about you a little bit, when you, mm -hmm. growing up in England, mm -hmm. uh, knew that you wanted to be an actress when? Well, it sounds awful, but I mean, I, I can't, I've always wanted to be an actress. I can't think of a time when I didn't want to be Why? an actress. I don't know, I suppose it's just showing off. Really? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, was it somebody on the screen that you said, that's who I want to be and that's what I want to do? And I don't, I don't, I don't know. I. I I don't. I, I really don't know. I mean, I was I was brought up on sort of TV and yeah. um, you know and terrible sitcoms about children running away from home with ho getting horses and I don't know and all this sort of thing seemed so wonderful and I, I you know I was always I, I as a child I used to write stories about other people the whole time so I, I don't know maybe I was you just you had an imagination I had a bit of an imagination yeah. yeah and then you leave when you were seventeen or eighteen to go to Paris mm -hmm. yeah. Um, which was, which people say to me often, what a brave thing to do, and I think actually it was rather a cowardly thing to do. It was because you had been rejected some way that well, you... Well, I, I, I had wanted to be an actress, never really dared tell anybody about it, never really dared admit to wanting to be an actress, and then I'd managed to get myself into a, a drama school where I was doing a teaching course. Yeah. And I was miserable. I didn't want to be a teacher at all, but I'd managed to persuade them that I did, and so they gave me this 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 place and I was just miserable there and it was so difficult for me to be amongst all these people who were actually trying to become actors and and I just thought no I can't be here anymore and so I went off to Paris to sort of sulk and then I just stayed <laughs> and what was the break you got married well, my, you had two kids. Uh, well I had I I I got married um, 10 years ago this year yeah um, but the I think my first big break was well, it was. I mean, it was when Prince found me for... Um... How did he find you? Well, that was because he was making a film in the south of France, and he was casting to find young girls to play the kind of young mm. girls. And I turned up, and... You had the look. And, yeah, I had the look that he wanted. And he said, well, have you considered... Would you like to read for the lead? And I said, well, yeah. <laughs> of course, <laughs> I know, but... So I did, and that was that. And suddenly I was being whisked off to the south of France in limousines and having manicures and things. I'd never even stayed in a hotel before I did that. So it was all very, very new. And, and you were, what, 20? I was 20, 22 or something like this, 22, yeah. 23, something like that. Have you stayed friends with him? Yeah. Really? Yeah. And you've gone through all the sort of permutations yep. in his life. Well, I haven't a clue. I don't know yeah. how, what to call him. I've just yeah, sort of, I don't I just sort of what grunt. What is his name today? Yeah. I kind of grunt when yeah. I say <laughs> right. you know, on the phone. Yeah. But, mm, um, but you became friends and stayed friends? Yeah, 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 yeah. And what was next? After that was a handful of dust. Oh. Then I had a bit of a lull because I went to Los Angeles and tried to sort of see whether I wanted to stay in Los Angeles. And at that time, I didn't. Um, and I came back to, to Europe to sort of start from scratch. But I started from scratch, but with a with this experience um, of having made a, 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 you know, having played a, a leading role in a big American picture which was under the cherry moon and so yeah. I, you know, I knew how to, I knew the sort of how, basically how to do my job, um, the rules if you like. Yeah. Um, and so then I, then I made a handful of dust and that was, that was my first, I would say it was my first really, um, which, time when I really had to sort of work hard at, at acting. Work hard at acting. Well, that sounds awful, isn't it? Yeah. Um, well, I just had to think more, you know. It was just hard. It was difficult. Really good fun. You said once, I don't think of myself as very intelligent. I don't think of myself as very articulate, which is exactly the image of you now. Sorry? Smart, savvy. <laughs> tech. And then you said, I'm not that at all, you know. There, I mean, there's, there is about you a sort of extraordinary, but not just, ambition, almost like Catherine, to do everything. Yet at the same time, there's something else there. I mean, ambition is not all of it for you. I think, I think it depends what you call ambition. I mean, there's an ambition to be an, an important actress. Yeah. And there's also an ambition to be 
someone who stays at home and looks after mm. the children and yeah. you know but, I mean there's just two things that I and it's all a question of keeping them in balance and sort of juggling I mean I, I'm a juggler I'm not really mm. an actress do you think this kind of success somehow is better when it comes for you the way it does I mean this is obviously is a lot yes exactly <laughs> this is a Go late on, changing experience I mean, you're 35 36 37 somewhere yeah. you know and this is a late mm -hmm. For the kind of stardom you and I are going to have, or mm -hmm. having, or experiencing, mm -hmm. is it better? I mean, are you happy that it sort of took well, the this thing is that now that I have, did? you know, I've, I'm, I, well, whichever way, I mean, whichever way it would have been, I would have always thought it would have better been that, better the other way, yeah. um, because that's the way we are. You know, we're all human. But um, I, 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 I'm, I'm thrilled what's happening yeah. now. I'm what do the children happy. mean for you in all of this? I, it's impossible for me to, to say what my children mean to me. Yeah. They keep a grounding for you as you go through all this. Yeah. It's, yeah. Well, you could put it like that yeah. if you like. Angels and insects. What did that do? I loved making that picture. I think it was one of the best experiences I've had working on a film, um, working with the director, very closely with the director, um, working very closely with the other actors. And we were really a group making that film. Um, and that really gave me the taste of what it's like to work as a group. And that's what we found when we made English Patient as well, that everybody working in the same direction for the same thing. Yeah. It's a really great thing. Um, I loved that character dearly. Um, she's one of my favorite favorite characters. Because I love Antonia Byatt's world. I love her universe, yeah. sort of dark and detailed and, um, and, and these, the strange things that, that she writes about, like the wrists and, and all these things that I found again in, in Michael Ondaatje's writing, this, sort of, this interest with odd parts of the body and, and yeah. uh, strange imagery that, that I, I, I really love that. Take a look at Angels and Insects. Here it is. All right. All right. Tell me. Since you invite the question, how old are you? I'm 27. I've one life. And 27 years of it have passed and I intend to begin living. Not in the rainforest, not in the Amazons. The place is very much an inferno. But you will go there. My work is there, Matty. I know how to live that life. I can learn. I'm strong. I'm resourceful. I have not been softly, contrary to appearances. You need not heed me once the voyage is over. It's a daydream. No, it is what I will do. Matty, Miss Crompton. Up here, at night, there is no Matty. My name is Matilda. Look at me. I haven't looked at you. seen your wrists, Matilda. I only wanted you to see me. I don't think that was all you wanted. Shall I stay here? Or shall I go back now? I should like you to stay, but it's not very comfortable. Tell me about the actor. Mark Rylance. He's um, he's a theatre actor, and I, th I think the director is the right title. But he's, I think he's the director of the, the Globe Theatre yeah. in London now. And he might not make another film again. I don't know. I mean, I, he might take a long time to make another one. I think he found it a very frustrating experience. Because he wasn't in control? Or? No, I think it's because he didn't find um, that there was enough time. and yeah. you know, He's very, very detailed. And, but he is an extraordinary actor. As you have no idea what you would do if you weren't an actor. No idea, because you weren't. <laughs> I'm afraid not. It's terribly <laughs> sad, isn't it? I just, uh, 
I think more, the more I work on films, the more I love it, and the mm. more I think if I had to stop being an actress for X, Z reason, yeah. I would like to do something in film. I'd love to be an editor. I think that's where it all happens, actually. For many of them, it does. In mm. the edit room. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. This is four weddings and a funeral. Most people, most people, as you know what I'm going to say, <laughs> think, can't mm. comprehend why your character and the performance you gave didn't make you inevitable the one to be chosen. Here's the film. Oh, my name's Fiona. Um, I'm Gerald. What do you do? I'm training to be a priest. Good Lord. Do you do weddings? No, no, not yet. I will, though, of course. Jolly nerve-wracking. Yes. Rather like the first time one has sex. Um, well, well, I suppose so. They're rather less messy, of course, and far less called for condoms. <laughs> <laughs> mm. I haven't seen that in a long time. No, I haven't seen that for ages. Yeah. What film have you missed that you very much thought was just perfect for you? A character. It's so funny. It's such a funny question because my answer is that I... The ones you miss, you just forget them very quickly. Yeah. So there's no obvious. Um, none that spring to mind. I'm sure there will be. Catherine would have home. been there if oh, you Catherine. had gotten I mean, I, if I, it would have been impossible. I don't know what I would have done if I hadn't been able to play Catherine. I really don't. I think, I'm, I, I, think I might have really yeah. gone and done something, you know, I would have done a sitcom or something after that, I think, if I hadn't done that. I mean, there's nothing, it, you know, it would have been completely different. I would have taken a real U-turn yeah. if I had, if I had lost that part. How are you? Does all this sit mm -hmm. with you? This notion of everybody saying Oscar nomination, I hate brilliant it. performance. It's agony. Agony? I mean, it's agony because, I mean, which little girl, actress or whatever, hasn't dreamt of being one day yeah. rewarded and awarded? You were awarded. now where you always dreamed you wanted to be. Yes, of course, yeah. And? and it's agony. And it's, no, it's not agony. It's, it's not agony. It's just the idea of, of um, of, I, I'm really not the sort of person to sort of um, say, hey, look, everybody, I'm rather good in this. Would you mind voting for me? I mean, that sort of thing just fills me with horror. And I, I you know, just, you just sort of get swept along with it. And at the same, I mean, it's delicious, it's divine, but yeah. it's, 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 you know, it's very, very, very um, nerve-wracking. Are you happiest working? I love working. I really love working. I'm happiest um, with a, you know, with a with word somebody else has given me to say and a, and a camera. Mm. And a camera. Heaven. <laughs> and a chance to express yeah, well, interpretation. My, well, my, yes, it's my interpretation of, of somebody. I, I, I don't know what it's worth, you know, I don't know. But um, it's, it's a great, yeah. it's a great privilege to be able to do what we do. Yeah. It's a great privilege also to have an opportunity to do, to grab a role that you know can change everything. Yes? Yes, but change everything in what? Change everything what? because it gave you a different, it, it was like going somewhere where you hadn't been before in terms of in very terms different of performance. In terms of my acting. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Yeah. Every, you know, that, was, that was extraordinary. No matter how much they that. appreciated you. Mm. Because it, uh, I mean, it, because to play somebody like Catherine, with so much, um, who is so self-revealing. I, I mean, not who is somebody who the, the other characters I played, like Fiona, who you saw in For Weddings, and, and Matty in Angels right. and Insects, have all been characters who have been hiding behind things and, and sort of keeping everything quiet under wraps until painfully so D-Day, yeah. and then at, what, at a given moment they will then reveal all and that their, their secret, their personality that they've been hiding for so many years will sort of be released. But Catherine is not like that at all. She comes out with everything showing, you know, all guns mm. firing. She's there. Right. And when you, know, she you comes like off it or the you plane like and, and yeah. yeah. And to be able to play that self confidence and, and sort yeah. of um, and kind of openness, somehow I had to get to that myself. Because you, know, you can't go there hiding things. And how did I you mean get Anthony that? said that I was hiding a lot. I don't know whether I was or not. Yeah. Anyway.
Well, um, but here's what else you've said. I got to get out of here. But the, here's what else you said. You said that uh, somewhere that there was a sense that you had an idea of her in your mind, and when you began to work with Anthony, kind of stripped it away. Let's take this away, and yes, let's take this away, too. so that in the end, it is her beauty and her life force mm. which made her so naked and vulnerable to you. Yes, Anthony wouldn't let me do any of the things that I have been using for, you know, for my characters up until now in, in, in my work. He wouldn't let me use any of the shortcuts or the props, props or the, the kind of veils. Yeah. He, he wouldn't let me put anything in, in inverted commas. He wouldn't let me... Everything yeah. had to be just simple straightforward because he wanted to strip it away because he said there's a wonderful quote in which he said what he loved about you <clears throat> that'll be good this time <laughs> <laughs> it was that somehow that there was a laser right to you, who your your inner being mm. that that's what you delivered mm. well i don't know about that either. you don't know about that no yeah. what's next don't know either you don't know no and i'm keeping good. i'm keeping things sort of open because I'm, I'm driving everybody mad I know um, I mean, agents friends mm, yeah people who are waiting people for you to make who, a decision people who are, are, are wanting me to uh, and I, I just I just want to go very gently now is it important for you now to choose extremely well it's very important for me to choose extremely well because um, now I've made this film and it's getting the it's getting the, the, the whatever, is, you know, people are loving it and it's working very well and it's, it's so good to do that. I can't tell you how, how many times I've made a picture, for example, my Romanian film, for example, which is a tiny little film, you know. And it's so sad when people don't go and see it. And, and now, think it's... Because I, you know, I believed in it and now I, and I really believed in The English Patient and it's like we all did and, and, and and here is the film that we thought we were making, and it's working. And it's just the most thrilling thing. And I, and I want to do this again. <laughs> find another one. Yeah, I want to find another one that I believe in, and then will work. What do you fear the most? Mm. Sort of, I fear, um, I, don't, I don't know, kind of mediocrity, I think. You know, that's even admitting that is pretty dangerous, I think. Because the bar is higher now. Because the bar is higher and yeah. more is expected. More is expected and more is expected by other people, more is expected by from by myself, yeah. from more, myself, whatever. Yeah. You, you demand more of yourself. They I demand, demand more of, of you. Mm. Yeah. Thank mm. you. Not at all. Pleasure. My thanks to Kristen Scott Thomas. Coming up next, the Cohen brothers and Francis McDormand. Joel and Ethan Cohen are two of the most original of contemporary filmmakers. Since their debut in 1984, they have revitalized genres. Film noir with Blood Simple, madcap comedy with Raising Arizona, and the gangster epic with Miller's Crossing. In 1991, their film Barton Fink won unprecedented Best Film, Best Director, and Best Actor awards at the Cannes Film Festival. Fargo is their latest work, a comedic thriller that film critic David Denby referred to as the dark side of a prairie home companion. It stars Frances McDormand as the pregnant sheriff of a small town in Minnesota called upon to investigate a strange murder. She is here as well as the Cohen brothers, and I am very pleased to have them here. Welcome. It's Thanks. great to have all of you here. Here is my first question. This movie was not based on... An actual crime. Who says? Was it? <laughs> yeah. yeah. It was. Yeah. And this story is completely based on a real event. Yeah, the story is the characters, you know, we we weren't interested in making a documentary, and the characters are really inventions um, based on the sort of outline of events. Yeah. So we invented the characters. Um, um, and they're really sort of our creation and the creation of the actors who played the parts. 
so Steve Jimmy and and all the and Francis and all these terrific ensemble company that you have put together here in a sense made their characters what they yeah. became yeah I mean more so than in the uh, in the in the vision and ear of a uh, and pen of a screenwriter? Um, well, I think it's probably the same sort of combination as in most of our scripts. We imagine the characters a certain way when we're writing them, and we often write for particular actors. I mean, we've, we've actually are tending to do more and more of that as we make more and more films. As we did in this movie for Francis's part and the part Steve Buscemi played and the part Peter Stormare played. Yeah. So, it's, you know, it's a combination of our sort of imagining them a certain way, and then when the actors come in and they begin to really embody the parts when you start rehearsing, you know, we almost, I think, kind of let go of it at a certain point, and it becomes the invention of the, of the actors who are playing it. Francis, we're going to get to you. Hang on. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Tell me, what is it in your eyes? that you make you guys original and different. I mean, when we say Coen Brothers, everybody knows exactly what kind of film we're talking about. We know, in a sense, that it's going to have a certain quality to it. What do you think it is? And what is it that makes you different as filmmakers? Yeah, that's hard. I mean, it's, we're probably the worst people to ask that. Probably. I mean, as far as we're concerned, what we're trying to do is just something different from what we've done before. So Each time out. Yeah. I mean, just for the sake of variety, just in the interest of keeping life interesting for ourselves. So to the extent that there is anything that the movies have in common, we're not aware of it. We sort of try to avoid it, in fact. Yeah, yeah. and it is always str it has been strange from the beginning to be sort of considered so aggressively idiosyncratic in a way. Um, I mean, I, I'm not saying it isn't true. It's just that from our perspective, um, it's always been sort of a strange thing to consider or a hard thing to sort of see from the outside. I think for the reason Ethan was saying, you just kind of approach each story um, on its own terms and you try and tell it the best way that you can sort of imagine and um, you don't think about it sort of in terms of it being yeah. strange or quirky. Did, were you a fan of their work before you married one of the Cohen brothers? Well, they didn't have any work when I met them. Oh, is that right? Yeah. <laughs> is that right? I met them on their first film, Blood Simple, which was my first yeah. film. So we all kind of started doing it at the same time. Um, after a week, I was a big you, fan. You were a big fan. Yeah, big yeah, fan, I'm, big fan after work. Was for it week. their work? Or? Um, it, was, it was a really unique experience in that uh, probably most of the people on the set, on the crew, and the cast, I think Emmett Walsh, who was an actor in the film? He was the oldest person on the set, so it was, you know, it was kind of a lot of people starting what they wanted to do professionally for the rest of their lives. How was it different? I mean, well, I'd never done a movie before, so I, I didn't have anything to compare it to. But I you only have had now. Theater. How is it different working with yeah. them? Um, there's no tension on their sets. I mean, obviously, there's the yeah. tension if a major problem comes up, but it's kind of just like hanging out. Um, yeah and you end up with a movie at the end of it. But I think it's because they collaborate together from the very beginning of the writing process that everybody feels mm. like it's a collaborative effort. Tell me about your character in this movie. <gasps> what do you want to know? Well, I mean, this is, I've seen Fargo, obviously, and, and it's, it's a, it, it, everybody is talking about it. I mean, it just, it's a wonderful film, but you know that, and critics have said that. I uh, think it's, I think maybe it seems strangely exotic to people because you haven't seen it on screen before. Haven't Minnesota. seen what? No, Minnesota. Minnesota. The landscapes, the, 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 the flatness dialect, and the, the music and, and of the, the dialect. You can feel the cold. I could. Mm. You know. And the dialect was the most striking thing, mm. the way people talk. Yes? Yeah. It's a music. It's a music, but it's in the script because they're from there. I know. I was going to say, you, you, did you want to do a film about Minnesota, from Minnesota? I mean, is Minnesota a character in this film? Oh yeah, I think very much so. In our, in our minds, it was. Um, I I think yeah, that was one of the big attractions to us about this. It was doing a movie about um, the place we grew up in, and also you know it's also talking about the d sort of rhythm of the speech and the way people talk there. I mean that's frequently a way that we sort of get into imagining characters when we're writing them. It it frequently starts with the way they talk. 
Ethan, set this up. This is a scene in which uh, Francis' character, who is a sheriff of Brandon, investigates a crime scene where this car had gone off the road and snowy strip of, you know, it's just morning sickness. Set up this scene for me before we take a look at it for the audience at home who haven't seen the film and clearly would want to, will appreciate the scene more. Yeah, this is the, pretty much the introduction of Fran's character. Fran is the chief of police of a small town in uh, rural Minnesota, and she's been called to investigate the site of a triple homicide, which we, the audience, have seen the whole sort of setup and the perpetration of the crime. A uh, state trooper has been killed, and two people who we, the audience, know were just sort of innocent passers-by. And uh, we see Fran here sort of reconstructing this, the uh, crime from examining the scene. All right, old tape, here it is. Here's the second one. It's in the head and the hand there. I guess that's a defensive wound. Oh, yeah. Where's the state trooper? Back there, a good piece in the ditch next to his prowler. OK. So we got a trooper pull someone over. We got a shooting. These folks drive by. There's a high-speed pursuit ends here, and then this execution type deal. Yeah. I'd be very surprised if our suspect was from Brainerd. Yeah. And I'll tell you what. From his footprint, he looks like a big fella. You see something down there, Chief? No, I just think I'm gonna barf. Jeez. You OK, Margie? Yeah, I'm fine. It's just morning sickness. Well, that passed. Yeah? Yeah, now I'm hungry again. Well, there it is. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I guess I should have mentioned when I set it up that Fran's character is also seven months pregnant. Yeah, exactly. Uh, here, tell me about the writing process, the two of you. I mean, I think it was, it was Sam Ramey, Ramey who said that that watching you guys work was like watching badminton, you know, that there was a kind of give and take, that the process That was dull, in, huh? That <laughs> dull, yeah. Badminton is not my favorite sport either. Uh, that, no, it's a very actually, genteel sport, isn't yeah. it? Uh, actually, it is true that in terms of writing, we do sort of, writers who collaborate sometimes split, split a script up and one does one scene, one does another, and then somehow they graft it together. We, in fact, don't work that way, but just sort of talk each scene through, back and forth. And how much does the actor add to it? Right. Well, they cast really well. And yeah. what's interesting about working with them, as opposed to other directors I've worked with, there's not a lot of improvisation. You stick to the script because you want to. It's really well written. It's kind of like a play. So um, I think a lot of it has to do with the casting. And because they write for so many actors they know. Yeah, but I think there's Nick Cage who said uh, that, that it was difficult to work with you guys because you, you pretty much set the character that you wanted, you know. And then therefore you cast who fits, which as you said, casting is, is a huge part of it. Not so much having the actor define the character. Does that mean you agree, or does that mean well, it's interesting? Well, I think in Nick's case, Nick's got a... Um, I understand why he said that, actually. In Nick's case, he's got such a fertile imagination, you know? And, and he, and, uh, you know, all kinds of wild stuff occurs to Nick. Um, um, at least, this, you know, this was a while ago that we worked with him, but all kinds of wild stuff occurs to him when he's on the set. And, we're, and, and um, I think in, a, in, in Raising Arizona, to a certain extent, it was our job to kind of sit on that a little bit, mm -hmm. which, to tell you the truth, I'd much rather sort of edit an actor than have to sort of kick him to get, you know, mm -hmm. to sort of stimulate that kind of thinking. Um, it was a lot of fun working with him, but it was kind of editing. But you'd rather extent. do that than have to absolutely. jump start. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You also spend a lot of time, I'm talking a lot about process here, but it's interesting because you're different, a lot of time on preparation. I mean, you really, I assume it's, it's cost effective and that's part of the reason you do it, yes? Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, we, you know, but come from low budget filmmaking and are still practitioners of it. Um, and, you know, when we first started out doing Blood Simple, where we were doing a movie for less than a million dollars, you had to be able to say to the designer, for instance, you know, we need this wall and this wall, but not that wall. Um, and in order to be that precise in terms of sort of shepherding your resources and making, getting the most bang for your buck, uh, we really had to 
thoroughly sort of think out how we were going to shoot each scene. And to a certain extent, the way we work now is still kind of a, you know, a product of that mindset. Right. Also, I mean, in terms of doing, well, certainly not so much in the case of this movie, but our previous one was sort of heavily an effects movie, which you have to pre-plan, I mean, to a large extent, again, more than we had to in this movie, which was, I mean, there wasn't much in the way of effects, virtually nothing in the way of visual effects. Did you, um, did they, your movies make money? Well, you know, it's, um, some of them have and some of them have. It's keeping the records. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> this art book wall said I never would have sued Paramount if I thought it, knew it was a nonprofit organization. Um, you know, the last it, one did really poorly. The last <laughs> one did not. This this one looks like it's going to do fine. Raising Arizona made a lot of money. Yeah. Barton Fink made a lot of money overseas and did not do well here. Um, Blood Simple, our first movie, for the budget it was made yeah, on, made a, made a lot of yeah, yeah. made a lot of money. Um, so on balance, actually, despite our sort of rap, <laughs> uh, most of our movies have. Could you, could you create a movie if, if you decided to go for the bucks? Forget the moi. Forget all this stuff. There Forget is, uh, genre. If we were good boys. <laughs> yeah, I mean, just, <laughs> come on, fellows, make me a movie that's going to make me some money. So uh, like Joel Silver. Yeah, yeah. that's right. A good friend, Joel. Joel Silver. Yeah. Just come on, man. I'm going to give you a shot to make a movie that'll make some money. Can you do it or not? Uh, or are you hung quiz. up on it's, all this little In terms of big art. money like that, Are you hung up on art, guys? I'm not hung up on art. <laughs> I guess it's still an open question, isn't it? It certainly it? is. But to us, anyway, maybe some people have closed the books on it. <laughs> you haven't given up on the idea. Yeah. No, but we'd love have. to do that, to tell you the truth. But Honestly, the question is, could you? I don't know. I don't know. I, you know, I'd like to think we could, but yeah. I don't know. Um, so far, we haven't made I mean, a movie you, you, that's... Yeah. Because it takes a certain skill to be able to say to, to yourself, yeah. you know, I'm going to make a commercial judgment at every point yeah. here. And therefore, you give, in a sense, you, you have to pass on what your instincts might be. Right. That's, that, that's frequently the case. And if I had to do that, I'd be lost. Yeah. Yeah, but then on the other hand, I mean, you know, first of all, one always hopes. And secondly, I mean, in terms it's of what... It's a quirky business. Yeah. It, it's you know? like notoriously idiosyncratic what yeah. works and what doesn't. And then thirdly, we do like to do different kinds of things. So maybe one of the experiments will sort of hit the jackpot yeah, okay. in that sense. <laughs> all right. Francis, tell me, what do you like about this character, this sheriff? She's good at her job. She's yeah. really good at her job. And, and I, also, I also really like the idea that, you know, she was pregnant, but that was just a fact of her life. Yeah, you know, she's yeah. she's got blonde hair. She's pregnant. She's just going about business. And um, I think that she's in her. You know, she's extremely simple to yeah. figure out. There's not much, not much it's complicated about Marge, but she she's still surprising. She still surprises. How about her answer, relationship with her husband, which is a very interesting little take. It's great. I think it's great. I mean, it's interesting because a lot of people have called it role reversals of, yeah. a, of a kind of a classic marriage situation, which I think is kind of short-sighted because... She's the breadwinner, he's the artist. Yeah, it's not that simple. They're both doing what they're good at. Yeah. John Lynch, that uh, actor that played Norm, he and I had a kind of little Norm. actor story on the side that they were probably both on the police force. And uh, she was better at it. And so she moved up through the ranks because only one of them could in a small town police department. And he got to go home and do what he really wanted to pursue, which was his wildlife artistry. Even to getting it on a stamp. Get, which is a huge, you know, yeah. it's a huge accomplishment for him. So I think it, it's great. I, I think at the end of the story, you know, they're doing really well. I want to show another clip, but, but before I do, talk about ensemble characters. I mean, the people that come. Steve Buscemi is just terrific in this film, and others. Mm -hmm. uh, is it? it yeah, it, this really was probably more than anything else that we've done, sort of an ensemble cast, because yeah. you can't really point to any one role in the movie as sort of carrying the movie or being the lead role in the movie. Francis He's, more than anyone Francis else. Francis more than anyone else. She's just but bigger. It's, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> She's pregnant. It's true. Yeah. Fran, more than, it's, Fran yeah, is Fran. kind of the center of the movie, but, um, but um, there are all these sort of satellites that keep sort of yeah. spinning through the movie, and it really is sort of an ensemble cast, I think more than the other stuff we've written. Some brilliant performances. Set this clip up. This is, uh, let me tell you where it is. This is, uh, this is where I'm Joey uh, Lundegaard. Uh, set it up for me. This is where... No, this uh, is where uh, they, they meet the two, two guys in, 
Oh, and yeah. He's trying yeah, to yeah. Hire this is the beginning hire, of the yeah, movie. beginning of them. I should say this. These are out of order. This is before we know anything, before the scene you saw in which uh, the sheriff discovers the scene of one of the crimes. Yeah, this is the kidnapping which uh, kidnapping scheme which precipitates the events that we saw yeah, uh, earlier. But I don't think it needs much no, setup. No, I don't think it is. No. Very but, well, let me just set this up. What this story is about, this is a story of a man who wants to buy into a real estate venture and he comes up with a scheme that what he will do is he will kidnap. He will hire some people to kidnap his wife because he believes that his wife's rich father will pay enough money for him uh, to go ahead and make this real estate investment, which somehow will be the salvation of all of his problems. Here is beginning of that film in which they are talking about that scheme. Roll tape. I'm uh, Jerry Lundegaard. You're Jerry Lundegaard? Yeah. Shep Proudfoot said... Shep said you'd be here at 7.30. What gives, man? Shep said 8.30. We've been sitting here an hour. He's peed three times already. Oh, I'm sure sorry. Shep told me 8.30. It was a mix-up, I guess. You got the car? Yeah, you bet. It's out in the lot there. Brand new Burnt Umber Sierra. Yeah, okay. Well, sit down, then. I'm Carl Showalter. This is my associate, Gayer Grimsrud. Yeah, how you doing? So, we all set on this thing, then? Sure, Jerry. We're all set. Why wouldn't we be? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm sure you are. Shep vouched for you and all. I got every confidence here in you fellas. I guess that's it, then. Here are the keys. No, that's the... not it, Jerry. Huh? The new vehicle plus $40,000. Yeah, but the deal was the car first, then the 40000 Like as if it was the ransom. I thought Shep told you. Shep didn't tell us much, Jerry. Well, okay. It's... Except that you were going to be here at 7.30. Yeah, well, that was a mix-up, then. Yeah, you already said that. Ah, uh, the character who comes in playing uh, Joel Lundegaard, Joey Lundegaard, is William Macy. Yeah. Right. It was a brilliant, wonderful performance, one yeah. number. Bill really wanted to say, it was going to be a blue Sierra, the car that he's paying him off with, but Bill really wanted to say burnt umber Sierra. <laughs> so you allowed him <laughs> to have some range there, did you? It's a little improvisation. <laughs> <Some bobbization>. <laughs> <laughs> burnt orange. Or, uh, Janet Maslin, who was frequently on this program, said that the title is about seeing how far the Coens can go. <laughs> Go. Well, um, boy, hadn't thought about it that way. <laughs> we just, you know, we haven't really given sort of down to Is this choice, a joke she would say with the audience or the film community? Oh, no, no. Um, I mean, we were, just in terms of the title, we were sort of presented with the, uh, in our own minds, of, you know, calling it either Fargo or Brainerd, which is the other town it takes yeah. place in, <laughs> which we thought sort of, Fargo you know, better. particularly, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, but no, I mean, this is, um, um, in a weird kind of a way, for us, it's just, as Ethan was saying, you, ki you kind of, from project to project, you look for something different to do. And for us, this was sort of an interesting experiment in a different kind of approach, a more sort of naturalistic approach to the story. Barry Sonnenfeld used to be your cinematographer. Yeah. yeah. He's now gone on to be a director. Right. Uh, you have a new cinematographer who is? Yeah. Roger Deakins, who's shot the last three movies that we've done. Yeah. 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 Yeah, Roger's, um, and again, I mean, we worked very closely with Barry on the first three and right. very closely with Roger on... How do you divide up responsibility? Between the two of mm -hmm. us? Oh, it's pretty loose. I mean, we almost don't. I mean, we don't really in any formal way, in any defined way. It's just very fluid. I mean, it starts with writing, which, yeah. as I said, was very back and forth, and that just pretty much continues through the whole production of the movie. Good luck with Fargo. Great Thanks. to have you here. It's great to see you again. My thanks to the Cohen brothers and Francis McDormand. Coming up tomorrow night, Anthony Minghella. He is the director of The English Patient, also Michael Andacha, who wrote the original book, and Milos Forman, the director of The People versus Larry Flint. See you tomorrow night.